Welcome to the History of the Batman with London, brought to you by Meltdown Comics and Collectibles in Hollywood, California. This is where we relive the defining moments of one of the most iconic figures in comic art and literature, the Batman. My name is Adam Silverstein, and I'm joined today by London and from the Shadow Shadow Adam. We also have in the studio Mason Booker, our producer and engineer. We are coming to you live from Hollywood, California on a Wednesday. Meltdown is bumping tonight. There's the Meltdown comedy show. We got tons of stuff going on. So if you hear some stuff in the background, that means you need to be down here and uh, hanging out because we've got quite a bit of stuff going on. Anyway, London, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. I am doing well. I'm excited for this week's episode. Last week we had Batman 101, yep. which hopefully gave listeners a good starting point in which to, you know, read Batman stories. Exactly. So that was nice. And <laughs> this week you prepared a special top 10 countdown. Is that correct? Yes, I did. <laughs> Can you tell us what the top 10 countdown is? We will discuss the DC Comics imprint of Elseworlds, which all consist of alternate stories, universes, tales that go outside of the regular continuity, and we are going to discuss 10 of Batman's best, unique, different types of Elseworld stories. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to break down that term, Elseworlds, Elseworlds. Yes. Uh, in a second, but first I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, ComicsFix.com. This is a digital comic book subscription service that can be read on your tablet, your computer, your phone, whatever. It's amazing. They've got a huge library. You pay a monthly fee and you just get to read, read, read. So check it out at ComicsFix.com. Also, like to shout out our partners at Loot Crate. Loot Crate has teamed up with Meltdown. And if you enter Meltdown in the promo code section when you order your Loot Crate, then you will get some money off. Uh, Loot Crate, if you don't know, which I can't believe anyone doesn't know because they are basically ruling the world right now. <laughs> They are a subscription box service, so you subscribe to them, and then they will send you a box full of exclusives for whatever genre they're going to do. They've got a D, or actually not a DC, but they've got a villains box coming up, which is very cool. And uh, the subscription service is only thirteen ninety five a month, so that is pretty cool. Again, use Meltdown, and you'll get three dollars off your Loot Crate. Check it out, LootCrate.com. All right, London, the Elseworlds. What is an Elseworld? An Elseworld is a type of what-if story. It's something that is, it's a, it is an imaginary story, which actually those terms, the what-ifs, the imaginary stories, that all started back in the 1940s. It began in Superman comics and action comics, and they were clearly stated that this is the regular continuity. This is what Superman's doing in the real time in Metropolis at the Daily Planet. But then it'll say that this is a what if so-and-so happened. It's something that gives, I think, the artists and the creators and the writers a chance to go outside of the box and go outside of what they are writing in terms of what's what the characters are doing just in the regular world and get to explore more of their imaginary side literally and figuratively so elseworlds didn't the actual term didn't come into the late 80s but we've seen a lot of different alternate stories what ifs and imaginary stories in the 40s and 50s and they kind of became more predominant in the in the 1960s in World's Finest Comics, there's one that's one of my favorites. It's World's Finest 172. It was in 1967, and it's an imaginary tale, and it says, what if Bruce Wayne, who lost his parents when he was young, was orphaned, and Jonathan and Martha Kent raised him and 
in pretty much Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent were brothers. Right. And what happened is instead of Bruce Wayne being in Gotham, he actually worked in Metropolis and Clark Kent worked or was Superman in Gotham. And it's a story kind of like that. It's something where, well, that's not what's usual. We know that Bruce Wayne wasn't raised by Superman's parents. And it's it's, it's all a what if. It's it's all imaginary. It's right. they're, they're really interest. They're all really interesting stories. And for the time period, it's very fun. <laughs> right. So Marvel actually used to do what if comics. Are you aware yeah. of that? Yes. Okay. And that is clearly a what if scenario. A what if scenario. Yes. And I remember there would be one is what if Bullseye didn't kill Electra and things of that nature. Yes. And so what you're saying, I think, is that in the DC universe, at least with respect to Batman, that artists have been able to do stories and interpret Batman or tell a story without any restrictions of past continuity. Exactly. And in the imaginary stories in the 50s and 60s, in the comics on the panel, it would clearly say, this is not real. This is not what happens. They make sure the reader knows that they give a really clear distinction. This is before it's a whole publication and you know this whole story isn't in continuity. So you get to have the feel of the what ifs and the imaginary stories probably within a comic book that has the regular continuity story within it. But now they don't necessarily say that, do they? No. Because last week in Batman 101, you talked about, for example, The Long Halloween. Yes. And Dark Victory. Yes. Those weren't in the regular continuity. No, they weren't. So those are stories that the writer decided to tell just using the characters from the Batman universe, but actually creating a new unique story. Right. And that and that happens a lot in different stories throughout the last few decades. But I think because of the what ifs and the imaginary stories in the golden and silver age, they wanted to dif- differentiate it. But there are tons of stories like Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale's stories that now they just put out the books and you kind of just know based off of the story and the timing and what's happening. Oh, well, this isn't happening in real time in Batman and Detective Comics right now. Right. So it seems that if you are new to the Batman reading experience, You Mm -hmm. can follow the continuity, which is the story that builds upon years of stories, essentially. And that is in the periodical comic books that come out every month. Right. And then if you are, you know, telling a unique story, then that's going to be in more of a trade or a special event periodical. Right. It won't be in the same, it won't be in the Batman publication line or the Detective Comics publication line. Or even if there's a publication that says this isn't in the normal continuity or even ones that are like Legends of the Dark Knight, those are stories that are told more in the early years or it's not the exact time as say whatever Batman issue it is there unless the publication says these are the stories that are within this time frame that talk about these certain events now it's it's separated like that it's more in the actual publication right so hush that storyline was in the normal Batman right. series. Right, so that was within the regular continuity. Okay, and again, if you don't know Hush, we talked about that last week in Batman 101. Yes. So if it fall, have they ever done a story within the regular series, the regular numbering that was not in the continuity, but in Elseworlds, to in, your knowledge? To my knowledge, I don't. I don't believe so. And if they did do stories that were separate, it was based off of what's happening in the in the bigger story. In the bigger story, and then it's a flashback or it's a it's a different type of story, but never something completely outside of the context. Right, like when I believe Grant Morrison was having Batman go through time to get back. Right. He would. It was still technically within that same time when Bruce Wayne in the real world was dead to everyone. Right. So it still fall, fell right. into it. Um, like Batman 666, that was a story where 
uh, they imagined that Damian Wayne, Bruce, Bruce Wayne's son, was Batman. So that was kind of, in a way, a futuristic story, but still within the same continuity that Damian was still his son. He was, it, it kind of still, it was just a more looking into the future. So that's probably one that might fall into a, what if Damian became Batman? More of the popular ones, that was a... Andy Kubert and Grant Morrison story. Okay. So So it just provides artists and creators and writers a lot of freedom in which to take the basic essence of a character and create a totally unique story. Yes. All right. So we have a countdown. And are we counting down in any particular order or is this just a list? It's a list, but I... It's not necessarily a particular rank. It's not saying number 10 is anything less than number one would be. But I just think these 10 that we're discussing, they all give a very different representation of Batman, whatever era or whatever he's doing, yet it can all call back to the Batman that we know in regular continuity, the same type of uh, the way his personality and the way that he acts and the villains and the characters that we encounter it's all very reminiscent of the batman that we know right. in comics every day <laughs> okay so if we it doesn't help to count down from 10 to 1 no but okay. there are 10 books right okay <laughs> so we don't we don't need to do a drum roll for <laughs> no all right all but- right but we we will have one, I'm sure, soon. We can we can do the drum roll. <laughs> okay, I want a drum roll. <laughs> there you go, Mason. Thank after, you, Mason. After Effects, Mason. Special <laughs> Effect, Mason. Okay, so let's start with number ten, just to give me a little excitement on the list. Okay, number ten is, and like I said, that's why it's not really. 10 is better than one because a lot of people, I think, really like this story. And it's more because Batman, in in a lot of different publications, like Brat, Bat, Batman the Brave and the Bold, he interacts with other characters. In Justice League, he interacts with other allies and big superheroes. So I think that by itself attracts readers and there is a there is an Elseworld that came out in 1994 that was written by Mike W. Barr called In Darkest Night and it is when the Green Lantern of Earth dies and Bruce Wayne is summoned to become the new Green Lantern. So Batman is essentially Green Lantern and if People aren't familiar with Green Lantern, which I'm sure many are, but pretty much they're an interstellar kind of law enforcement type group. And there are different Green Lanterns all over the galaxy, the universe. And there's one particular to our Earth. And they all have a ring that can execute extraordinary powers and it's and for the green lanterns it's all done by will so if you can think it the the ring will produce it and so batman who that's why it's interesting because batman is a human and that's one of the reasons why we love him is now given this extraordinary power and just like he does in regular continuity he uses this new gift these new abilities to fight crime in gotham and we see him go up against different villains and even come up against this Red Hood gang who in turn resembles Joker in regular continuity. So the basis of this Elseworld is that Batman becomes a Green Lantern, which in the regular continuity, besides maybe one or two books, you would never see that happen. That is a pretty cool story to get the interpretation of how Bruce Wayne uses the ring to do the things that he would like to see done, which, right. I, which I'm sure is different from Hal Jordan, who is the original Green Lantern. Exactly. What were Do you know what some of the things that Bruce Wayne did that was different or improved upon by his use of the ring? It was more he still kept his 
martial arts, his fighting style, it just was more packed a punch to whomever he was fighting in Gotham. And that's where the story becomes interesting because we're introduced to Sinestro, who many know is one of the main foes within the Green Lantern Corps. And Batman has to arrest him and Sinestro then seeks revenge and he gains a yellow ring and he travels back to Gotham to seek vengeance on Bruce Wayne. And once tragic things happen, such as Bruce Wayne talking to Commissioner Gordon in the story, he's trying to find more information about the people who killed his parents that same origin is still in this else world and sinestro kills gordon and even though in this story gordon doesn't have that much of a positive reinforcement with batman he thinks that vigilantes are nothing but trouble batman or bruce wayne still becomes enraged and he starts to become more violent using the ring and that's when the the corpse question whether or not he's worthy of such power because with the Green Lantern, it's with will and it's with good. And so he uses the ring in a positive way, but once his vengeance and anger come in, it's sort of questioned. Right. Okay. That's an interesting take. I, I never actually heard that. Where could someone find that? Is that, what's that title again? In Darkest Night, in Darkest and Night, Night is K-N-I-G-H-T. Okay. And, and it's by Mike Barr and Jerry Bingham did the illustration. Is that in a collected form now? Yes. it's Even though it's one arc, you can still get it in a graphic novel okay. sort. You don't have to go search out the actual just comic. Do, it's collected. Do you know if it, it was actual comics before it was collected? Yes. It was, it was just a one shot. Okay. Cool. So that I and I always like seeing Batman with given such power because it's such the opposite of what Batman represents in the oh, regular. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is interesting because he's got such an agenda that he does on his own. Right. It's like why what increase it by tenfold when you've got a power ring? <laughs> I mean, wow. It could be it, he could be dangerous. So and it's, and especially since he's known as one of the most intelligent beings yeah. actually in the DC universe, his mind can do wonders. And so. I don't I, I don't know where I'm thinking of this, but for some reason I remember seeing or hearing or reading that Bruce Wayne in the Justice League kind of thinks of Hal Jordan as a clown. Or is that mistaken? It depends on interpretation because sometimes he can be silly or even kind of a jerk. So that right. it, it depends. But yeah. Because it would be, uh, you know, Bruce Wayne saying essentially, you're a clown. I'm going <laughs> to show you how to use right. this thing. <laughs> you You've been using it all wrong. <laughs> anyway, number nine. Number nine is... A story from 2004. It's a one shot as well. It is called Batman the Order of the Beasts, and it is an Eddie Campbell story with Darren White as artist. And it is set in World War II England. And Batman is in his kind of his first year, his early years of being Batman. So he's, it's, it's not, of course it's not the exact same as Frank Miller's year one, but it's an another story that you can see Bruce Wayne trying to hone his own style and how he wants to be the mask vigilante, the hero that he wants to be. But he has to to travel to s save major players that are within World War II. It's this type of the Order of the Beast is this kind of gentleman's club, and slowly members of the club are being assassinated. They're being killed. And so Bruce Wayne has to come and figure out how to stop whoever is killing off these major leaders. And within the story, you even know that one of them, one of the targets is Winston Churchill. So it gives it a kind of historical context within England in this time of war. And it's another view of, of Batman 
it's interesting. You don't really see the political at all type of Batman, even when the comics in the 40s were happening. All you saw were war bond covers, but you never had us had Batman within the war itself. So it's an interesting Elseworlds to place him in that time period. Right. Was Batman wearing his cape and cowl yes, that he's, we normally would see? Yes, he still has the same Batman look. And that's why I really like Darren White's interpretation of it. It's kind of dated, but it calls back a little bit to how he looked originally. There aren't the purple gloves that we see in Bob Kane's Batman in 39 and 40, but it's still a kind of more golden age Batman that we see running around. But Bruce Wayne and Batman play major roles into figuring out who is attacking these high society men. So he employs his detective skills and his superhero skills. Right. In a totally different setting than what one would be used to. Yes. And does he succeed? Yes, he does. And I think the story just itself, it's interesting because you see him kind of struggle being Batman. He's perfect as Bruce Wayne, the society person, but since it's his first year kind of being the caped crusader, he's struggling, which you see most of the time in year one, first year Batman stories, whether it's from Frank Miller or even from Scott Snyder in Zero Year. So you still get those elements from a story that's completely out of the regular universe. The interesting thing, I think, is that when you tell one of these Elseworld stories, you can sort of pick and choose what earlier continuity you might actually pull from. And you can yes. pull you can pull from different, you know, stories. I think obviously you always have the parents being killed in the alley. That seems to be a constant throughout any right. world or any interpretation of Batman. But maybe certain things are still a little bit different or could be not. You know, they pick and choose. What is it going to be? I don't know. But that's kind of a neat thing that the creator gets to do. Yes. That's why I really like Elseworlds because when you read, no matter which one you read, whether it's the 10 that we're covering now or other ones, there's always something that is from the regular continuity or the regular mythology that we know. And like you said, something that is a constant in all of these is how he became Batman. It's rare, There are very few. I think we're only going to talk about one that is different from how he turned from Bruce Wayne to Batman. But that constant of his parents being murdered and that origin still stays even in these out of universe. Wow, stories. I can't I can't <laughs> wait to hear the one where. His parents are not killed. I, I, can't even, <laughs> I can't even imagine how he gets the motivation, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll tell yeah, me. Yeah, I will. <laughs> All right. Number eight. Number eight is an Alan Grant story. It is called Batman Demon, a Tragedy, and it kind of is a tragedy. And Jim Mar Murray does the art, and it's... it's kind of falls within the horror genre the way that it's illustrated and interpreted and you you get to see Etrigan who is a character but he's pretty much a demon like character people have even seen him in the animated series if they remember the episode but what happens is Etrigan begins to kill people in Arkham Asylum and maliciously murder them and they're torn to pieces and then commissioner gordon has to come and figure out who is doing these crazy things because it doesn't seem human like and simultaneously bruce wayne and main in wayne manor he every night he keeps having these hor horrific nightmares and in this story he has a girlfriend who's named Belinda mark and you don't really hear that name in any other story. There's not really a reference to a Glinda Mark. Yeah, she didn't no. make our love interest list. She did not. <laughs> she did not make our love interest. She is 
completely organic to this story, which I think is awesome. I always like when they throw in love interests that aren't in the regular mold. Yeah, totally unique <laughs> one. Exactly. So, of course, being the worried girlfriend, she says, we need to figure out why you're having these nightmares. They don't seem normal. So they go to this kind of voodoo herbal doctor who turns out to be Poison Ivy. And when she senses Bruce, she sees this kind of evil aura around him. And so she gives him this medicine, kind of a remedy that says these will cancel out the nightmares. Your life will be back to normal. You don't have to have this evil presence on you anymore. And so going back to the killings that were happening earlier, Etrigan, he was, this demon was killing a lot of the villain killer Croc, his men. So he wanted to figure out who is killing my men. And he goes to Catwoman and they, and so she goes and tries to figure out what's happening. And what you discover in the story is that Etrigan and Bruce are connected in a spiritual way. And as Bruce becomes he takes the remedy that poison ivy gives him and the nightmares go away in his his dreams they go away etrigan becomes weaker and that then he goes after the people that he knows and he loves and of course bruce going to alfred who is his father figure in a way he tells him what's happening and alfred and this is the best part of the story to me alfred reveals this secret that he's actually Merlin from a thousand years ago and Bruce is a vessel to a bat-like demon that is technically Etrigan and the story is that like a thousand years ago 1400 years ago there was a civil war within between Metropolis and Gotham City and Gotham was losing so he so they summoned Etrigan from hell and said, "I want you to destroy all of Metropolis soldiers and men so we can win the war because there's no way we can win just with us." And even though they say they succeeded and Gotham was victorious, they couldn't send Etrigan back to hell. So they needed a vessel, and it turned out to be within the family line of the Waynes. And so that's why Bruce has these stories or these nightmares of Etrigan because when Etrigan is killing, that's what he feels, even though his unconscious feels Etrigan's conscious murders. So just that by itself <laughs> really intrigued me because I am a horror genre freak. So I love things like this. Anyway, so after Bruce finds that out, he wants to stop Etrigan and he wants to stop him from killing all of the people he loves because now Etrigan is mad. So he not only goes after Commissioner Gordon, but he and then but he tries to go after Alfred, but it doesn't work. And then he wants Alfred who who is now Merlin. He says, I don't want Glinda, my girlfriend, to be harmed because I love her. And since Etrigan is mad and wants to go after everyone that I love, I want you to put a spell, kind of put me in a trance and make me forget about her. Make me not have these romantic feelings for, for her so Etrigan doesn't think that she is someone that I would care about. And the, the story kind of ends where... Bruce wakes up and he didn't have the crazy nightmares, but Alfred comes to him and says there were tons of killings last night and a uh, Glinda Mark was murdered as well, but Bruce Wayne doesn't remember who Glinda is. Jeez. <laughs> Man, it's I, insane, that but is. it's really good. <laughs> right. Now, so did that meet equal Batman and horror standards for you, or was it a better horror? Was it a better... Batman superhero type? I think it had a good mixture of the Batman horror genre. My favorite is the the vampire Batman, which is actually in our 10, so I'm excited to get to that. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think that if you like those type of stories and you're... A, I, th I would definitely recommend those. And, and if you like your Batman dark, this is definitely a dark 
story. And even looking at, you get to see the bat demon and it is a very extreme, scary version of Batman. The cape, the cape is torn and scalloped in a way. His he has these huge claws and just huge teeth, and he just is red and just it looks like a demon, but kind of in a Batman costume, all torn and tattered. It's it's kind of it's 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 definitely a tragedy, just as the title suggests. So that's right. a really cool Else World. So give that title one more time. Batman slash Demon a Tragedy and it's by Alan Grant and oh. it's it's a one shot but you can collect it within a graphic novel you don't have to just look for the <laughs> the issues the now issue. when you say a one shot I'm thinking one issue yes okay that's one issue it's it's not in two three or four it's just one book which means just like in any of the one shots they're a little bit thicker a little bit longer they're not just the regular story because it's all within packed in one to one book understood thank you for the <laughs> clarification of course <laughs> all right what number are we on next are we on six uh, or seven number seven i can't remember <laughs> trying to go through them we're on number seven and this book is really fun i think a lot of people think it's silly but it's imagining if batman was in an american western it's called batman the blue the gray and the bat it was from 1992 it was written by elliot s Magan, and it was it's a one shot it's one of my favorites that I own, actually. It's it's just very, if you, first of all, if you love Westerns, you, you'll enjoy it. I know that it seems kind of silly in the way the art is rendered, but it's it's in a historical context, not exactly like the World War, World War II England, but it's set within the American West and during the period of when Abraham Lincoln was president and Batman a form of Batman and his kind of adopt is he's like his adopted son Robin who kind of looks and dresses like a Native American which is kind of the the cowboys Indians type look if you had to put a label to it they have to protect a a gold shipment and send it to Lincoln so you come across a President lot of, Lincoln yes wow so you and you come across different characters within that period, like Mark Twain, and it's a very Lone Ranger Western type story. Especially if Robin's <laughs> dressing as a Native American. Yeah, it's it's definitely different than when how you usually see him. And even and yet Batman is still with he has the cow, he has the cape, and he has a black stallion who has a batman emblem on him i mean it's kind of outrageous yeah. it's a little much it's a little extra <laughs> yeah it just goes to show what you can do with batman yeah, right? but the they wanted to put him within this context but yet still keep the kind of core iconography that batman has even in the regular stories right so that yeah. one is a one shot, and he was using well. guns too. Yeah, he was using guns because in the West it was pew pew. It was yeah. <laughs> he, he used guns, so yeah. it's so people may not like that, but if you think about it within the context of the time period of what he represented, he was this cowboy. It fits. He's not he, his no guns type policy that people know now. That didn't that didn't register at all within the story. Right, and he wore his uh, his regular hood too it was there was no cowboy hat right it's he literally looked like batman but just on ye a horse yeehaw. <laughs> exactly. yeehaw. the zorro slash lone ranger version yes put, so to, put on the wild West. i think it's a fun story yeah and i know for people who like their batman all dark and brooding they'd be like oh this is silly but I think if you like any type of different interpretations and never knew this existed, I think you should check it out. It's the Batman, the blue, the gray, and the bat. There you go. <laughs> Number six. Number six. Really awesome four-issue arc. It's Batman Year 100. It's by Paul Pope and Joe Villarubia. And when did this come out? That came out in 2006. Wow, Paul Pope is doing some major stuff right now yeah, in the he, comic I world. I know. I yeah. Battling Boy? Yeah, Paul he's fantastic. And so this story, this Elseworld, I know for I've talked to a lot of people 
on the blog and the pages and things. And this was one of their favorite Elseworlds, one of their favorite stories. And since, and this story is a futuristic take. I know before, this is in 2006, the f- more future that we saw is probably in Batman Beyond, things like that from the animated show to the comics. But this is set in the year 2039. So it's kind of funny to think about it now in 2015. But within 2039, the government in a way, has full control over all of the intel and has tracking on everyone in the world, it feels like. It's all technologically based, but the only person they don't have any files, information, tracking anything on is, of course, Batman. So a government official is killed and it it goes under an investigation and at the time it's captain gordon and since we're in the future that's commissioner gordon's grandson so it's all pushed which then brings a question is who's batman right and even in the story you never really find out who batman is they don't they don't establish if it's bruce wayne if it's if it's Bruce Wayne Jr. or anything like that. You and don't. Damien hadn't been brought up by then. Exactly. At that, time. at that time. So you actually don't find out who Batman is in the story. So that's another which factor. Is which is kind of cool because not only did the government in the story not know who he was, but you as the reader didn't know right. either. So you kind of, on your own, in your own imagination, kind of figure. Right. Which is sort of the image that Batman projects or would like to project. Right. You know, you just know about Batman and all his background and his backstory because you read the comics and it's following his life. But to the average person in the DC universe, you look at this character as a mysterious individual who you know nothing about. Right. The exactly. cops can't catch him. <laughs> no one can get near this guy. He's he does. He he seems like he beats everyone, even though we know he doesn't. Mystery <laughs> of the God Complex, uh, episode <laughs> four or three, I can't remember. But um, it's amazing though, because that is what his image is, and Definitely. it sounds like they really nailed it here yeah, in this year one hundred. It's fair. I love the fact that it's there's so much mystery behind this character. And so, since the 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 gov- the agent, the part of the person died, uh, Captain Gordon has to go, and he doesn't think that it's this Batman that everyone. Since they're like, he's not on the grid, we don't know who he is, so it must be him. But Gordon has a feeling that no, he didn't do this, and so Batman, wherever he is, and Robin, who is a young kid and we don't really know the relationship or the affiliation they have. He's kind of like a mechanic of sorts. It's kind of weird. He, he rides a motorcycle is very cool young kid, but he's the Robin to the Batman and they go and try to solve the mystery themselves because they didn't commit the murder and still try to stay off of the grid, stay away from having the information found and Gordon has to come with them and help try to figure out who solved the mystery. And Paul Pope's writing is fantastic. And what I really liked about it is we were talking about if this is collected and there is actually a trade paperback because this story, Batman Year 100, is in four issues, but Paul Pope adds um, a, a, a comic that was in originally printed in Batman Chronicles 11 from 1998 and it's called The Berlin Batman and what happens is that Batman is set in 1938 Gotham it's right on the height of World War II and he has to fight Nazis and all within this story you learn about his origin story which of course involves the death of his parents and how he became the caped crusader so Paul Pope within this trade paperback not only gives you Batman Year 100 which is a futuristic take on Batman and even how it's illustrated the kind of swept back ears and it 
has a very gothic feel to it, a very golden age feel to it. And yet all of this technology, all of this futuristic Gotham is surrounding it. You not only get the future, but you also get when it all began in the past in 1938, 1939. And both times you see Batman is fighting for justice, whether he's on the grid or not. And I think that's why Elseworlds are a really great imprint or really great stories to read because even though they're all different and represent different Batman, different time periods, Batman always represents the same thing of justice. I Bam. <laughs> that's it. That, that sounds like a good one. Yes. I yeah I def I always recommend Paul Pope's writing. But Batman Year One Hundred, very good arc. Okay, definitely. <laughs> sounds like if you get the collected, you're going to get a bonus story as yes. well. So that might be a good value, and definitely a good entry point into the Else Worlds Batman. All right, number five. All right, number five. It is Batman Thrill Killer, which was in 1997, and it was written by Howard Clayton and illustrated by Dan Breton. And it's set in the 1960s, which is one of my favorite eras, just in general. <laughs> and it focuses more on Barbara Gordon and Dick Grayson. And it's kind of, they have this flower power, whirlwind, kind of free love, romance thing. Barbara Gordon is this rich socialite, and Dick Grayson is still within the circus acrobat uh, whole thing, but they fall in love, and they decide that they want to dress up and they want to fight crime and save people in Gotham, and so they become... Batgirl and Robin by themselves. So it's interesting you don't really have a Batman. You don't have a Batman that influences either of them because in the in Detective Comics 38, Bruce Wayne takes in Dick Grayson and he trains him to be Robin to his Batman. In Detective Comics 359, when Barbara Gordon appears, she's inspired by Batman, so she makes her own costume and becomes Batgirl. None of that happens within this Elseworld. Batman is not the influence for them becoming Batgirl and Robin. So that's already an interesting setting that Clayton put into it. And it's a two-issue arc. So the first issue establishes them becoming Batgirl and Robin but then it's all not too happy and it kind of goes downhill when tragedy strikes and Dick Grayson's family is murdered his parents are killed and that puts them into a vengeful mode and that also brings in Detective Wayne so Bruce Wayne within this world he's just a detective he's part of the police department he's not He's not a, a masked vigilante. He's kind of like Gordon. So he goes and he's trying to solve the murder between them. And Batgirl and Robin come across a version of Joker in, in this world. And it's a female Joker. And she discovers the real identities of Batgirl and Robin, Barbara Gordon, and Dick Grayson. And she kidnaps Grayson and tortures him, and unfortunately, she takes his life. And because of this, Batgirl, Barbara, is enraged because she lost the love of her life, and she lost her partner. And then once Bruce Wayne, Detective Wayne, discovers that Joker killed Robin, he becomes Batman, and he joins forces with Batgirl to find Joker and apprehend her. Uh, and that's the one. It, and it, technically, that's the one where it's not because of his parents. Yes, a tragic death happened. But, but it, it was a different one. It was a different one. And and Detective Wayne wasn't that close to this Dick Grayson in the sense of it was back in 1940. So the motive is a little different than what we're used to. But if you like the kind of 60s era and the atmosphere and the different interpretations of characters to see the female Joker and to see the kind of rough exterior of Robin and Batgirl, Batman Thrill Killer, definitely cool. Two issues, so it's in the tray paperback and collect them both. And yeah, that's one of my favorites because I am I love the era. So That cool. is cool. <laughs> I like that one. So who who's that by? That's by Howard 
Shaken. It's C H A Y K I N. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then he's the writer. Yes. And then Dan Breton is the illustrator, the main illustrator. Good, good. Wow, what a creative take. I mean, that is the first time I've ever heard of Batman becoming Batman, not because of witnessing his parents' right. death. <laughs> it really is amazing that, you know, that is, it seems to be the sacred origin. You really don't mess with that. And to mess with that, you have to be pretty you know, I guess, uh, I don't know, brave would be the word. You have to be pretty confident in what you want to get across. Get across, definitely. Be because that is, everyone knows it, you know? <laughs> right. Everyone knows it. It's, it is the Batman, and you're the only writer to do something different. That's impressive. Yes. I think that's worth checking out alone just on that fact. Mm, I do, too. So... <laughs> All right, cool. Number four. Okay, number four. I am a huge Egyptology person. I'm a huge fan. As I, I studied that in college. So this one is more for me, but I think it's really cool. It's called Batman Book of the Dead. It, it's a Doug Warren. He wrote it, and Barry Kitson is the illustrator. It came out in 1999, and it... It mixes in the Egypt mythology within a kind of crazy, almost ancient aliens type story, I guess, if you want to put it in this context now. I know back in 1999, ancient aliens didn't really exist, but now it kind of fits, which is fun. But you start off with looking at the Egyptian god Set, who kills his brother Osiris, and then you get or you it's just you get all of the egyptology all of the gods within this story first and then you see that bruce wayne is an archaeologist and he goes and is excavating the pyramids at giza in egypt and him and another archaeologist discover this huge secret that the pyramids were built by this other race. It wasn't built by the Egyptians. And every time, and they discover that every time this secret is revealed, that the archaeologists, um, they perish, they're killed, something awful happens to them. So they have to try to get the, the mystery out, to try to avoid death. And it's all because of a bat type of god that what do they call it? Nec Nectron, which is how do you spell it? Maybe that's a better N E K R. I mean N E K H R U H. So I I even try to think about what could that be connected to in the actual mythology. But it's a bat like god, <laughs> which there's so many different gods within the canon. It could be many, but it's the story itself is it's an interesting take and i always love mixing batman with egyptology and even within the eight, the late 70s and the 80s there were superman covers and wonder woman covers and even batman covers that had the great sphinx that was controlled by someone and even in the 66 show there was king tut and who was an original person in the show and kind of playing around with different historical contexts <laughs> we got a party going it does. on. It's a chorus. Fun. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what happens in meltdown. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I enjoy it probably because of the the Egyptian history and the interpretation of it. But it's a great Elseworld, and I think you guys should check it out if you can, especially if you're into Egypt history like I am. <laughs> so Egyptology is the study of ancient Egypt. Yes. Okay. And being a student of that, yep. and then seeing it be brought forth in a Batman story, were you satisfied? Did they pay proper respect? Did they do any extra research that you could appreciate? Or was it just a story in ancient Egypt? I think they did a little bit of 
research because the fact that the god Set, S-E-T, killed his brother Osiris and then Iris brings him back from the dead and then they have the god Horus. They at least put in the Set killing his brother Osiris and that triggers the whole bat god and the curse and everything. So you, there has to be some type of actual knowledge about the mythology to put it in there. So it, it, for me, it was great because it's a mixture of two things that I love. <laughs> right, but you weren't distracted from the story by their lack of research no, or their... it wasn't... It wasn't like that. It wasn't too bad, no. It was, it was, a, <laughs> it was a solid story with solid research in a cool setting that yeah. mixed everything. And so, even if you're not into it like I am, I still think it's a fun adventure story to look into. If you ever want to see her get really pissed off, just put on an episode of Ancient Aliens about Ancient Egypt and just oh, yeah, watch her that's just, just yell terrible. at the TV. It's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> So that is what gets her going. Yes, things like that or historic movies. Like I just can't sometimes because I know that's like that's not true. That's not what happened. I, I just, but anyway, <laughs> I, I just saw straight out of uh, Compton that the you, premiere. Oh, you did, and uh, that is some history. <laughs> it is. Was it good? It was good. Yeah, it was. I would have to say, Ice Cube's son. I know s- stole he, the show. He looks just like. Him. Oh my god. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Okay, cool. And also, if you were interested, listeners, Meltdown is selling straight out of Meltdown shirts. So if you go on meltcomics.com, you can pick yourself up one. They are going to be in limited runs, but they are very cool. Yes, I have one, and I'm so thrilled. It's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) And now everything is straight out of. I know. You can't. I know it's promotion wise, but it's. Fun. They're straight out of Gotham. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? <laughs> okay. So are we on number three? Yes, yet? we're on number three. We're we're almost there. <laughs> no, I'm I'm just I can't wait to hear you talk about the vampire. Yes, that and that's the one we're doing. Stay oh good. <laughs> Kelly Jones fangirl. Yes, I am. Can't even deny All right. it. So de- so okay. so lay some foundation here. Okay. So throughout the nineteen nineties there was the Batman Vampire Trilogy. There were three different comics. They all came out within a few years of each other. The main writer was Doug Moynch, and then Kelly Jones, John Beatty, Todd Klein. They were all um, illustrators on the book, and Kelly Jones was the uh, principal artist. And the first one is Batman and Dracula Red Rain, and that came out in 1991. And what happens is... Dracula and his vampire minions come to Gotham and they're starting to kill people. And Batman first tries to combat Dracula and he can't because Dracula is too powerful. And he has an ally named Tanya who was a vampire and then she wasn't anymore and yet she can give Batman the necessary strength to equalize fighting with Dracula so she in a way turns him into a vampire and so at the end of the first book Batman and Dracula fight it out and even though Batman kills Dracula before then Dracula drains Batman of all of his blood so now Batman has this awful bloodthirst and he is a vampire forever it's not temporary it's not anything just for this fight so batman is turned into a vampire then we have the second book which is batman bloodstorm and that came out in 1994 and it's the same creative team and batman along with catwoman and alfred pennyworth and commissioner gordon they all are now have their sights on the Joker who was bitten by a vampire, Dracula, and is now a Joker vampire. And tragically, Joker kills Catwoman, and Batman is so enraged and so upset that he goes and drains Joker of all of his blood and kills the Joker. And a lot of these... (laughs) episodes and we've talked about before how Batman never kills a Joker and Joker never kills Batman. It's a very intense panel to see Batman just go all out and not even just as Batman as a vampire just bite Joker and even as Joker's dying he just has this huge smile on his face. It's the actual illustration is 
remarkable to me. Um, so Batman realizing, even though he, he wanted to kill Joker, he's like, I don't know what I've done. I'm scared I'll kill more people. So he asks Alfred and Gordon to drive a stake through his heart to kill him so he can't harm anyone else. And so that's how the second book ends. And then we have the concluding book, which is called Crimson Mist. And that comes out in 1999. So all three of these books span throughout the 90s. And do, do these stories, they build on each other. Yes, right? they build on each other. It's it's almost a part one, part two, part three. It's not necessarily named in the parts, but they all are within the same story. They just were published set in through throughout the years. It wasn't back to back to back. But now you can buy all three in a trade paperback. So they're all collected. Yep, in they're one. all collected in a Batman vampire. It's all. Cool. Yep. And so in Crimson Mist, crime in Gotham is higher than ever because Batman's not there because they killed Batman because he didn't want to have the bloodthirst or kill anyone anymore. But it's so bad that Alfred and Gordon dig up Batman, take the stake out of his heart. He lives and they all go to fight off the criminals and Batman is so bloodthirsty he kills rogues that we know like Two-Face and Killer Croc and in the end it becomes a huge bloodbath and Gordon dies and everyone dies and in the end Batman can't take the loss of his family his friends his his loved ones everyone and decides that he's going to just walk into the sunlight and hopefully that all of the despair that he's gone through will be calm and done once he's perished as and he won't be a vampire anymore wow <laughs> so, that is, that's intense and it's, yeah. and you see batman sucking blood right oh it, boy it's great he's a vampire flavored vampire and the way that kelly jones draws Batman in no matter what, even if it's not Batman vampire. It's so if you love the horror genre, the the horror movies, if you even if you just love Dracula, you should read this story arc. You'll you'll love it. So that is one of my personal favorites and definitely a great Else world. And what a great personification. Batman is a vampire. <laughs> yeah. You can't really get more parallel than that. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely Elseworld type material. Yes. There's nothing like it. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Number two. Number right? two. Okay. So since Batman, his nickname is the Dark Knight, it's, it didn't really, it, I don't think it was that hard to try to have the Dark Knight actually be a knight within the round table. So, so he, he's jousting. <laughs> yes. Oh so our next one is Batman Dark Knight of the Round Table. It was in two issues. It came out in 1998 and 1999. And it was written by Bob Layton and Jose Luis Garcia Lopez and Todd Klein were the illustrators. And just as the story illustrates, you have, it's within the kind of, Merlin, King Arthur, 6th century type histories and legends that you've read in school, but it has the Batman mythos thrown into it. And that's another great thing about Elseworlds. You can throw Batman into even real type of history and make it into a great story. But what happens is Bruce Wayne, he is part of the House of Wayne's Moore, <laughs> which makes sense. And he is banished from his from his home and tragedy strikes and his parents are killed by the king and he has to go off on his own and he grows up and becomes the knight of the bat and he is part of Project Camelot, and he has to go and literally be a knight, a chivalrous knight in the whole armor and everything, and he has to save the king from the demon head Ra's al Ghul, and even though he has feelings towards the king because What did you his... just say? Did you say Ra's al Ghul? Father's name was pronounced Raish, not Ras. A common mistake. <laughs> Mason oh. is laughing at yeah. me. I can't. Uh, do you want me to say Raish, Mason? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> Natalia. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to say the demon head so we all know who I'm talking about so I don't get dirty looks yeah. about pronouncing it wrong. But he has to stop him <laughs> from killing the king. <laughs> and, of course, he succeeds. And it's it's just a very... It's it's a fun story because he's a knight. The Dark Knight is a knight. Do they actually hit his origin? Like, for example, his parents got killed in a event where maybe another knight beheaded them. Well, the or did they not talk about it? Well, his parents were killed, and that's why he has a problem with the king of Camelot because he had his parents ordered to be killed. So even though he is the protector and he's a knight of the bat and he is a savior of sorts, he has a kind of grudge against the king because he made him an orphan. But right. he, So there was proper motivation yes, to become was, the bat knight. Right. So his, the origin was still there and there was still reason why he would become, yes, the bat knight. I guess the other interesting <laughs> just little piece of, I don't know, information is that a dark knight back in normal knight stories is usually a bad guy, you know, the right. dark armor, the black armor. <laughs> and in this case, he wasn't. He wasn't. So he was saving the king. So it just goes to show that your armor, you can't judge a knight by the color of his armor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All number right. one. Number one, we're here. Okay. Great. Okay. It. Number one is important because it is actually the first official Elseworlds story within Ooh, the publication. This is a good number one. Yeah, so it's a good number one. And even though the, the Elseworlds Batman Holy Terror, which comes a few years later, is the first to have the Elseworlds logo on the book, this book, Batman Gotham by Gaslight, is the first actual Elseworld story. It came out in 1989, and it is a Brian Augustine story with art by P. Craig Russell and Mike McNola. And it is set in 1889, the Victorian era, and it's pretty, it's about Bruce Wayne, who comes back to Gotham after studying abroad, and he runs into Commissioner Gordon in this universe and you find out that there are all of these murders that are happening that are in the style of Jack the Ripper who is so Bat Bat Bruce Wayne uses himself and becomes Batman to try to figure out this mystery and on the way he discovers that he's being framed for the murder of all of these people and when he goes to court his so-called friend who i believe his name's Jacob Jacob Parker he's the district attorney and he convicts him and he sentences him to death by hanging so he goes to Arkham Asylum who which is the jail and through and he's able to get all of the files and paperwork through Gordon to try to figure out who the real killer is because even Gordon knows that you didn't kill these people. And he figures out the identity and has Alfred Pennyworth break him out of jail. And he dresses as a Victorian-like Batman. It's not the same cape and cowl, but he dresses as Batman and he finds the Jack the Ripper type, and it's the district attorney. And he himself has horrible motives. Even in the, um, he knew Thomas Wayne, who's Bruce Wayne's father, and he had romantic feelings towards Martha, who rejected him. And that caused him so much sadness and kind of made him go crazy that he started to attack and kill women who looked like Martha and that's why he went on a whole Jack the Ripper killing spree. So it's a little sick. <laughs> yes. But he that's the reason why he did what he did and even before anything could happen Gordon finds them and he shoots Parker and he dies and it's a, it's a great detective story. It's very gothic. It's within that Victorian era. And I think my favorite panels within that story are um, Bruce. In the beginning, he tells, 
he he's learning under Sigmund Freud <laughs> and he tells him that he keeps having these reoccurring nightmares and it's about the murder of his parents. So we see that once again, but the imagery is fantastic. You they're in the moonlight and then you see a bat scrolling through each of the panels and it's very symbolic and goes back to this is the reason why Bruce Wayne becomes Batman because of this tragic event in his life. And for it being the first Elseworld and being thrown into this era, it calls back a lot to the first Batman type stories, the look of it, the feel, the type of character that Bill Finger and Bob Kane created. And it's the first one. So if you have to read any Elseworlds, I definitely recommend Batman Gotham by Gaslight. <laughs> and, and Mike Mignola, who is the artist, right? On yes. this one. I mean, that's the creator of Hellboy. Hellboy, so yes. <laughs> definitely laid out a nice foundation for his writing and his style and his art, and took it on to Hellboy. Yes. So this is quality stuff. Well, that sounds like a fantastic top ten or a ten. And there are tons of other Elseworlds out there. I'm not saying these are the best. I'm just saying that these ten that we discussed in this episode, they all show a different type of Batman, whether it's a different era or he looks different, but yet you still feel the same Batman that you read in today's Batman comics that are in the regular continuity. There was a fan or that reached out about this particular um topic yes. is that right yes there was so, actually on twitter i don't know if he's listening but brandon holmes he personally asked if i would cover elseworlds and i told him i love elseworlds they're one of my favorite imprints so i think his twitter handle is nick the hobo nice <laughs> so if you're listening, thank you, Brandon, because you are definitely one of the inspirations for this episode. That's great. So what that means, listeners, is that if you have any questions, thoughts, suggestions on how or what you want to hear us talk about, what you'd like London to do a little work on, get her busy, uh, you can reach out and do that. We will listen. We are listening. And London, how, how do you recommend they actually do that? How do they get to you? Well, you can always email me at historyofthebatman at gmail.com. You can reach out to me on Twitter like Brandon did at twitter.com slash histofthebatman. You can message me on instagram.com slash historyofthebatman or or on Facebook.com slash History of the Batman. But yes, I I welcome all suggestions, comments, anything. I want to hear from you guys because you guys are awesome and you listen every week and I always appreciate it. So I always take your input completely. <laughs> yes, it's very nice to know that you can listen and be taken seriously and actually add to the show. So continue to reach out because... We've definitely had some wonderful response, and we want to try to get you involved as much as possible. So thanks again for listening. London, what do you got next week for us? Next week, we are going to do a character spotlight on Mr. Freeze. Hmm. I always like Mr. Freeze, and I think he's so misrepresented and isn't out there enough in media so and i know a lot of people know mr freeze probably from one particular aspect or one either comic or show but there's a lot more to him so i kind of want to dive into his history a little bit well, that's good because all i can really think about is arnold schwarzenegger yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'm sure there's a lot more yes. as i learn each week that <laughs> there's a lot more than what i actually know <laughs> So thank you, London. Thank you, Shadow Adam. Thank you, Mason. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. This has been fun. I'd like to thank our sponsors, ComicsFix.com, the digital comics platform where you get to pay a monthly fee and read as much as possible. It's great stuff, great platform, great comics. Check it out, ComicsFix.com, the Netflix of digital comics. Also, like to shout out Loot Crate. Again, Loot Crate is the subscription box service where you get 
unbelievable goodness coming each month. You can get on a one-month plan, a three-month plan, a six-month plan, a year plan, and each week or each month, sorry, you will get some very cool exclusives. I actually just gave you a few cool ones, didn't you I, London? Did. What did I give uh, you? Do you remember? Oh. I gave you, you know, a, I gave you a Batman tool. Yes, the, it's a battering. That's it's like five different things. <laughs> right. And it's, we did a show on the battering. So. And uh, yeah. and that was in the loot crate. And then there was another cool little statue. Yeah. That you can't it's like get a little any... Batman statue. I think you can write on it. It's very nice. cool. So that's that's loot crate. So if you go sign up at loot crate, enter meltdown in the promotional code section, and you'll get three dollars off. Your loot crate. Of course, we'd like to thank Meltdown Comics and Collectibles. That's where we produce, record, and talk Batman. So thanks again for listening to the history of the Batman with London, presented by Meltdown Comics. We will see you next week. As London says, actually, you could say it. Peace, love, and Batman. There you go. All right. (laughs) See you next week. Thanks for listening.